So if you're listening to these uh, Chapter 7 uh, lectures in order, you know that most recently I talked about these middle scale winds. Um, actually, backing up, I said it's really hard to actually anticipate where and when these micro scale events are going to occur. Within these middle scale winds, we do have some of the smaller scale winds going on, mesoscale or, or local winds, and I spent some time talking about um, land breeze, sea breeze, valley breeze, mountain breeze, uh, Santa Ana's, um, Chinook, that sort of thing are all local kind of medium sized winds and that means that they they last oh hours to I think we said days and now I want to focus on these global winds or these these um, uh, large scale macro scale winds and I I don't know if you caught but I said actually you can you can break these large scale um, wind patterns down into um, kind of the ones that you see on the weather map that are the H. We're going to call those anti-cyclones. On the weather map, the L's are cyclones, those sort of large weather blobs. Um, this is an example of a, a macro scale um, wind event. It looks like a tropical cyclone or a hurricane. Um, and then also in this chapter, actually hurricanes are uh, a chapter down the road, but in this chapter we're going to talk about um, prevailing winds, bands of winds that encircle the earth on a planetary scale. So that's like way cool. So the history of science is just an amazing thing and and the older I get the more interest I am in history. Um, but back in um, 1735 uh, George Hadley started thinking about these kind of global winds and you figure back then um, they cared more about uh, uh, navi or using ships, and so that was a big hairy deal. And so um, he came up with this idea that we have this planetary scale wind, and um, you see the word single? He came up with what, what we call the single cell model, and actually now we have a three cell model that I'm going to talk to you in the next segment um, model. And um, the single cell model just kind of gets us down the road. One of the things about just one cell instead of three cells in each hemisphere is that it doesn't get where, get us where we need to be. And we end up, uh, or I, I should say, um, one thing that that um, one of the things that Hadley did not take into account is the fact that the Earth spins on its axis of rotation. And so we end up with three cells instead of one cell because of that. And we'll talk more about that. But um, so let's take a look at Hadley's, um, in 1735, what he proposed as kind of these global, um, global winds. So what Hadley says, and, and, and rightfully so, is down here at the Earth's surface near the equator, we tend to, we know, um, tend to have warmer, a uh, zero latitude, we tend to have uh, our, uh, let's see, net surplus of, of radiation throughout the year. So we generally are warm there. Okay, one of the things we know about um, hot, hot air is it tends to have a low pressure. So here at the poles then, at the Earth's surface anyway, it tends to have generally cold temperatures. One of the things we know about cold temperatures is it has the little ball of gas particles are kind of squished together and they're relatively dense and it makes a high pressure. So we've been talking about um, air will relocate from a high to a low, okay, and in both hemispheres. So from a high to a low in the southern hemisphere too. So I know it looks like there are two cells, but can you see where there is a single cell in each hemisphere, right? <laughs> okay, so that's Hadley's single cell model. Um, uh, in a minute, I'm going to show you just kind of briefly the, the, the three instead of one. There are actually three cells now, and it, it's still idealized. It's not exactly, but three cells in each hemisphere get us down the road closer than his um, Hadley's single cell. Um, but before I do, I want you to kind of notice that, can you see the kind of the three dimensionals to this? If we focus on one cell, all right, and, and part of what Hadley proposed is totally correct. Let's start here at the equator. And let's go not along the Earth's surface, but you kind of have to go three dimensionally, go up. So we are ascending up in the troposphere. And actually kind of think, begin to think of this as that air rising near the equator in the troposphere hits the tropopause 
and it goes either way, okay? And so it travels in upper, at upper elevations, okay? And it travels towards the pole, and then it sinks, and then it travels along the Earth's surface. Okay, so even though this is one cell, and I'm going to kind of break it up into three cells instead of one, it's not bad. Okay, um, so let me show you the kind of the, the idealized three-cell model, kind of starting with Hadley's single cell. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so this is three. Um, this is our three-celled model. Okay, and I'll kind of show you the three cells here in each hemisphere. So three times two is actually six cells, right? Six circulation shell cells. And these circulation cells have kind of like that three dimensions going on, like I showed you a minute ago. Let me go ahead and kind of zoom in on this image. I think it's pretty darn good. And the next part, actually, the next several parts, I'm going to kind of be um, honing in on some aspects of this. But um, remember what Hadley said is near the equator we're going to have air rise and I'm going to kind of show you this three-dimensional here um, hit the tropopause and it's going to go both directions and I need to kind of take time to maybe describe why this is but let me go ahead and just show you in both hemispheres closest to the equator we do have um, one of our three cells is called the Hadley cell isn't that cute named after um, George Hadley um, but then uh, what happens and I'll kind of maybe try to convince you of why that is, but about 30 degrees latitude in both hemispheres, what happens is that the air from the Hadley cell descends. Can you see it kind of coming down? And then part of that descending air will return to complete the Hadley cell, and part of it will go towards the poles to begin along the Earth's surface, something we call the feral cell. So we have a feral cell next to the Hadley cell in both hemispheres. Um, then I'll just go ahead and kind of complete that thought. Our third cell is called the polar cell. And there's a polar cell down here, but you can't really see it. So what the polar cell does then is it bumps up against the feral cell. And um, the, a good way to kind of start the polar cell is to kind of go with this descending air from upper elevations. Okay. Um, and one of the things, the neat thing about the polar cell and the feral cell that I think is so cool is right here. Can you see that actually, um, and, and this, this transition zone is about 60 degrees latitude in either hemisphere. We're going to see, I mean, it's very approximate and it wanders throughout the year um, where these breaks are in these cells. Um, but what I started to say is what I think is a really cool thing is what they call the polar front right here between the feral cell and the polar cell. And again, I'll be talking more about this, but here we are in the Midwest right here. I don't know if you could make this out, but the North American, all that. So can you see what cell, which of the three circulation cells we are in the Northern Hemisphere? We are in the feral cell. And there's all so much to this three cell model, but do you see where it does sort of start out with um, with Hadley's single cell model. And there are some, um, notice that we have these along the Earth's surface. We kind of have these um, winds generally coming um, from the poles towards the equator, but in between we have the feral cell where we have them going the other direction. So these kind of twisty turns um, are added because the, um, added to Hadley's single cell because the Earth spins on its axis of rotation.